Hi, happy Monday, happy Memorial Day. I hope you guys are out doing something uh, different and special. I got back just a few minutes ago. My husband got me back just in time, just like he said he would. We were out on the lake fishing and we didn't get skunked. <laughs> we didn't get skunked and we saw a pelican and we saw a bald eagle and it was so beautiful. What a blessing. Uh, before we start, we are on truth link number six, the promised one. Truth link number six. This is a fantastic study and I'm excited to go through it with you. Um, but before we start, let's ask the Holy Spirit to be present. Precious Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for another day of life. Uh, today is a special day, Father, to remember all of those fallen heroes, all of the people that have given their lives for our freedom, and we pray that you will sustain their families. We pray that their lives will not be in vain, their sacrifice will not be in vain, just like your sacrifice was not in vain. What an amazing thing you did for us. We love you, and we ask your Holy Spirit to be present as we listen and as we open your word. Amen. Okay, so the promised one. The Old Testament is a promise of faithful love, a faithful love made, and the New Testament is that promise kept. The first gospel promise. Miriam Webster defines the word promise like this, a statement telling someone that you will definitely do something or that something will definitely happen in the future. The entire Old Testament can be summarized as a promise made by God to keep on loving fallen humanity at any cost and all costs to himself. The New Testament can be summarized as God following through to fulfill that promise in the life and death of Jesus Christ. As soon as Adam and Eve believed Satan's lie about the character of God, they ceased to trust their creator and fell into sin. God immediately took the initiative to pursue them and to promise their rescue from the enemy. Isn't that good news? I'm reading from Genesis 3, 9 through 11, and it says, then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? That's Genesis 3, 9 through 11. So here we see God's heart of grace on beautiful display. Of course, he knew exactly where they were. As they hid themselves in the bushes, he could have appeared right behind them, gave a tap on the shoulder, and terrified them. But he didn't. He could have burst into the garden shouting words of condemnation, but he didn't. He could have immediately wiped them out of existence, but he didn't. Rather, he came wooing, beckoning, initiating contact, and asking disarming, but probing questions to reveal that he meant them no harm, although the lie they had believed about him aroused in them the expectation of harm. And then addressing Satan in their hearing, God declared what scholars call the first gospel promise. And this is Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now notice the key aspects of this promise. Enmity, even though humanity had fallen into sin, God would implant within us 
a sense of hostility towards evil, a desire for justice, an inclination to resist evil, and long for restoration to our original state of innocence. Now it says, compare John 1, 9 with Romans 7, 14. So we are going to go to John 1, verse 9. And that says, That was the true light which gives light to every man who comes into the world. And this was talking about Jesus. Now Romans 7, 14 what does that say? Romans 7, 14 through 15. And it says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. And then skipping to verse 23, it says, But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Hmm. Okay, so... That is the enmity with which we war against, this sin that we have been born into. Now, talking about the seed, it says God will send salvation to the world in the form of a special human seed or offspring in whom the promised enmity will take on full form in a singular and rippling conquest over Satan. Compare John 14.30. John 14.30. Mm -hmm. And it says, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he is nothing in me. And that's a capital, me, which is good news. Galatians 3.16. Galatians 3.16. And it says, now to Abraham and his seed, capital seed, were, promise, were the promises made. He does not say, and to the seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. So Christ is that seed that they were talking about. 1 John 3, 8. 1 John 3, 8, and it says, He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning, but, this per but for this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. So Jesus came to destroy what Satan has done. That is good news. Okay, talking about the head, he shall bruise your head. The New International Version is stronger here saying he will crush your head. The offspring of the woman will conquer Satan on behalf of humanity. And it says, compare John 12, 31, John 12, 31 and 32. And it says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. That is wonderful news. He will draw all people to himself. And then it says Colossians 2.15. Colossians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians 2.15, and it says, having dis, I love this one, having disarmed principalities and powers he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. That's pretty incredible. So on the cross, Jesus Christ made a public spectacle of Satan. Wow. Okay, speaking of the heel, it says, and you shall bruise his heel. 
And yet in the process of crushing the head of Satan, the Savior will be wounded. It says go to Isaiah, Isaiah 53, 4 to 6. Isaiah 53, 4 to 6. And it says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. By his stripes we are healed. Isn't that amazing that we have a Savior that carries our sorrows, that was afflicted and wounded for us? Wow. Okay, and it says Matthew 26, 38. Matthew 26, 38. And it says, And he said to them, My soul, and this is speaking of Jesus when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Poor Jesus. Nobody could stay awake. They all fell asleep. He just said, Watch with me. And then Matthew 27 46 and it says and about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying Eli Eli lama sabathani and that is my God my God why have you forsaken me God hadn't really forsaken him had he he just felt the separation the weight of our sins that he carried separated him from God from the initial promise of Genesis 3.15, Scripture proceeds to unfold the Messiah's character and mission with added detail and deepening insight. Moses foretold that the promised one would come to the world as a prophet and as a sacrifice for sin. And that's in Deuteronomy 18.15 and Leviticus 4.32. King David said the Messiah would undergo horrible abuse and abandonment, and that's found in Psalms 22 and 88. Isaiah portrayed him as a suffering servant and a non-violent revolutionary who would set in motion an unstoppable movement of justice, and that's Isaiah 42 and 53. Prophet by prophet, vision by vision, symbol by symbol, song by song, the entire Old Testament spoke the mystery of the promised one who would come to disclose God's redeeming love to mankind and in doing so, unmask the devil's primal lie leveled against God's character, found in Genesis 3, 1 through 5. So what is absolutely incredible is that this time was foretold. 600 years in advance, the prophet Daniel foretold the time when the promised one would appear on the public stage to begin his saving work as the Messiah, as well as when he would be crucified. And we can read this remarkable prophecy in Daniel 9, 24 to 10, 27. Let's go there real quick because I love the book of Daniel. Daniel 9. Daniel's one of my heroes because Daniel prayed morning, noon, and night. And those are my prayer goals. Morning, noon, and night. Daniel 9, 24 to 27. And it says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks and the streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times 
Ooh, one more verse. Um, and, oh, two more verses. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Mm. And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. Okay, there's a lot of stuff in there. A lot of stuff in there. The angel Gabriel appeared to Daniel and declared, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up the vision and prophecy to anoint the most holy. Israel is here given a 70 week period of time to fulfill covenant faithfulness with God. In Bible prophecy, a day is equal to a year. And you can find that in Ezekiel 4, 6, Numbers 14, 34, and Mark 1, 15. And this is one of the precious keys that we have to understanding prophecy. So 70 weeks equates to 490 years. Gabriel then specified the specific historic event that would act as the starting date for the prophecy from which we can count forward to pinpoint the time when Jesus would launch his messianic career. Incredible, huh? Now know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So a total of 69 weeks. The command to restore Jerusalem was issued by the Persian king Artaxerxes in 457 BC, and that's found in Ezra 7, 11 through 12. And I hope that you go back and look at all these scriptures and read them for yourselves. So 69 weeks is equivalent in prophetic time to 483 years. Counting forward 483 years from, five, from 457 BC, we arrive remarkably at AD 27, the very year Jesus entered the public eye as the Messiah, a title that means anointed of God. And you can read about Jesus' baptism in Matthew 3, 16 and 17, John 1, 29, and Acts 10, 38. Gabriel continued to unfold the prophecy to Daniel by stating that Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, and that he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. In other words, in the middle of the 70th week, which would be AD 31, the Messiah will be crucified and thus bring an end to the symbolic sacrifice system of Israel. Thus, by his perfect self-sacrificing love manifested at the cross, Jesus fulfilled covenant faithfulness to God. Israel as a nation was now granted the opportunity to receive the Messiah and embrace his covenant faithfulness on their behalf. But tragically, they finalized their rejection of the Messiah by stoning of Stephen, by the stoning of Stephen, as he preached Christ to them, at which the point, the 490 year prophecy reached its completion in AD 34, and I hope that you go to Acts 7, 54 to 60 to read about the stoning of Stephen also, because he gave a beautiful, beautiful sermon during that time. Now I wanna show you a little chart 
of this prophecy, the 490 year prophecy, 490 years, 70 weeks, and this is found in Daniel 9, 24 to 27. From 457 BC, and then it ended in 34 AD. The two most important features of the prophecy of the, of the prophecy are these: Jesus would be cut off, not for himself, and by his death he would confirm the covenant. The term "cut off" in normative biblical language intended to convey the idea of complete separation from God. The word covenant indicates the strongest possible form of commitment. God's promise of faithful love at any cost to himself. And in Isaiah 54, 10, and in Isaiah 55, 3, it says, We see then that Daniel's prophecy foretold that Jesus the Messiah would voluntarily submit himself to undergo the most horrific demise possible, complete separation from God. And that's in Matthew 27, 46. He would do this, Daniel said, not for himself, but astoundingly for the fallen human race. He died for our sins. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and Galatians 1, 4 and 1 Peter 2, 24 and 1 John 2, 2 and 3, 5 and 4, 10. In so doing, he would reveal to the world the highest, strongest, and most beautiful manifestation of love imaginable. Absolute self-sacrifice for the eternal well-being of sinful human beings. Isn't that incredible? For the Apostle John declared, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And that's 1 John 3, 16. And Paul said, God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 8. This is the heartbreaking and beautiful point of the entire Old Testament. But God so deeply, so passionately, so selflessly loves each of us that he was willing to save us at any and all cost to himself. And the cost was great. That's amazing, isn't it? When the Bible says God is love, it basically means that God is relationally faithful to all others at any and all cost to himself. The voluntary sacrifice of Jesus at the cross is the proof. Promise made, promise kept. Yes, I heard that too. That's the whole Bible in a nutshell. The Old Testament Actually, I have a little tidbit in there for you. In Hebrew, it's not actually called the Old and New Testament. It's called the First Covenant and the Renewed Covenant. So I like to say this. In the First Covenant, God says, I love you with a faithful, unstoppable love that will never fail. And in the Renewed Covenant, God demonstrates the truth of his love in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. When the Apostle Paul looks at Jesus, he says, For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen, to the glory of God through us. That's 2 Corinthians 2, 1, 20. In other words, in Jesus, all God promised through the prophets is fulfilled. Everything God said he would do, he has done. His love has proven itself reliable, faithful, and true. We can trust him because he is trustworthy. Now it says experience. 
I can see that Jesus is God's promise of faithful love fulfilled. And my answer to him is yes. If you really stop and think about it, the most beautiful idea that can be conceived by the human mind is the idea of a perfectly faithful love. But the thing is, it's not just an idea. The only reason we can conceive of it and desire it is because it really does exist and it's awaiting our acceptance. Saying yes to Jesus is the first step in opening your heart to God's perfectly faithful love. Wow. God's perfectly faithful love. And that is my prayer for you, that you will say yes to Jesus. That was my decision, that every single day, I want to say yes to Jesus. That's my best and most important job. Show up and say yes. So God bless you today as you... I don't know what you're doing. You still quarantining? <laughs> it's been a while. All right. Love you guys and God bless you. We'll talk to you later. Next Monday at noon, we are talking about truth link number seven, which is journey to the heart of God. Woohoo!